Hello, I welcome you to this uh, series of lectures on uh, an introduction to turbo machines. I assume that all of you would have undergone uh, either a first level course in thermodynamics or both a first and a second level course in thermodynamics and would be familiar with all the concepts and ideas associated with these courses. You might have encountered the following uh, examples in your uh, thermodynamics courses. Examples such as uh, air flows through, uh, steadily flows through a compressor at the rate of uh, 2 kg per second, where it is compressed from uh, such and such a temperature and pressure to such and such a temperature and pressure. Uh, determine the power that is required to run the compressor. Or you may have encountered an example like uh, uh, steam uh, flows steadily uh, through a turbine uh, where it expands from such and such a pressure and temperature to such and such a pressure and temperature. If the mass flow rate is uh, such and such, uh, what is the power that is produced by the turbine? Now, a thermodynamic analysis of uh, these uh, devices uh, does not require you to know what is actually inside the device or how the state changes are accomplished. So you simply apply the steady flow energy equation and knowing the inlet and exit state, you can calculate the power that is required to run the compressor or uh, the power that is produced by the turbine. Now, the objective of uh, this uh, series of lectures is to actually uh, look inside the device and uh, understand the working, uh, the design and workings of the device. In other words, how does this device accomplish the uh, change in the thermodynamic state uh, that, uh, that it accomplishes using the given input power or how does it generate the power that it does uh, based on the change in thermodynamic state of the fluid. That is the objective of the course. So we will look at many such uh, devices uh, and uh, try to understand their design and working. What we will not uh, try to do is to answer questions like, you know, I have such and such an application, uh, which compressor or turbine is best suited for this purpose? So a question like this um, uh, falls within the purview of a full course on, on uh, turbo machines. So the outline of the lecture uh, is like this. We start with an introduction and a classification of turbo machines. Then we uh, look at the basic theory of turbo machines. Then we look at hydro turbo machines where we see uh, both the pumps and turbines. Then we uh, have positive displacement machines, uh, which actually are not the turbo machines, but the positive displacement machines are uh, quite extensively used in mechanical engineering applications. So it would be good to know how these devices work and also how they compare uh, with a turbo machine. So to that end, we will look at positive displacement machines also. And uh, the last uh, module in this series of lecture would be on thermal turbo machines. Turbo machines are rotating machinery used either for generating power through an enthalpy drop, in which case it will be a turbine, or for uh, raising the enthalpy of a fluid using input power, in which case it could be a compressor or a pump, okay, by means of rotodynamics. What exactly do we mean by rotodynamics? Okay. Uh, appropriately shaped blades are mounted on a hub or disc, usually called the rotor, and the rotor in turn is mounted on a rotating shaft. Now, the shape of the blade is such that as the fluid flows uh, into the device and is forced to flow through the passage between the blades, is, its enthalpy changes depending on whether the machine is power producing or power absorbing. In other words, uh, the uh, fluid that flows through the passage whose shape is determined by the shape of the blade itself and depending on whether power is uh, supplied or absorbed, uh, the enthalpy of the fluid uh, the, the enthalpy of the fluid increases or decreases. Okay. So in the case of a power producing machine, the enthalpy of the fluid decreases and is realized as work. And in the case of power absorbing machine, enthalpy of the fluid increases and uh, as a result of the power that is supplied to the machine. 
Now, you may recall from your course in thermodynamics that the specific enthalpy H is the sum of the specific internal energy plus the term P over rho. And uh, for most uh, substances, especially pure compressible substance, and the specific enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure, and the specific internal energy is also a function of temperature and pressure. Now, in case the working fluid in the turbo machine is compressible, such as air or steam or refrigerant, any change in enthalpy uh, can be due to a change in internal energy of the working substance, as well as a change in pressure. Since the fluid is compressible, uh, changes in pressure and temperature are related through the equation of state, and it usually results in a change in the density as well. So for a compressible fluid, uh, the change in enthalpy uh, can possibly be due to change in internal energy and changes in pressure. Whereas in the case of an incompressible working substance, such as water, any liquid which is incompressible, such as water, for which density is constant, uh, any change in enthalpy is due only to a change in pressure. Of course, it is possible that the, the, there can be a change in internal energy. Uh, it will be recalled that uh, the specific internal energy of liquids depend only on, uh, and depends only on temperature. And uh, in the case of uh, turbo machines uh, that handle liquids, there is very little change in the temperature of the fluid as it goes through the machine. So the flow is practically isothermal which means there is no change in the specific internal energy of the fluid. So in the case of liquids, any change in specific enthalpy is due entirely to a change in pressure. So consequently, we can actually uh, interpret uh, this statement, uh, enthalpy drop, uh, in the case of a liquid as a pressure drop, and increase in enthalpy of the fluid in the case of liquid as increase in pressure. So uh, when a power is extracted, that means you know the, there is a pressure decrease in the case of a liquid. And when power is supplied, such as in a pump, uh, the pressure of the liquid increases. Uh, turbo machines may be classified in several different uh, ways. And we will actually uh, look at classification of turbo machines in these two uh, ways, okay? The first one classifies the machine according to the type of uh, fluid uh, that it handles. So if the machine handles a compressible fluid such as air, steam, or refrigerant, then it is referred to as a thermal turbo machine because there's a change both in pressure and temperature of the fluid. In case the turbo machine handles uh, liquids such as water, oil, or any other liquid, then it is referred to as hydro turbo machines. It is only change in pressure. The, the term hydro refers to water, but it is used in general to classify or denote any turbo machine that handles liquids. Okay. Now, uh, we can also classify turbo machines based on whether they are power producing, namely turbines, or power absorbing. Uh, if it is power producing, it can be a steam turbine, a gas turbine, or a hydraulic turbine, which of course uses water as the working substance. In the case of a power absorbing machine, we could have a compressor, fan, or blower, all of which handle air, or we could have a pump which handles any liquid, including water. Here we have uh, an application of a turbo machine, namely the centrifugal pump. As mentioned earlier, uh, there is a shaft and the hub plate is mounted on the, uh, on the shaft. The blades are fixed to the hub plate and as the shaft rotates in this direction, the water is drawn in through this uh, part of the pump called the eye in an axial direction. So the flow, water flows in an axial direction. And then because of the uh, power supplied to the impeller, the water is forced to turn direction and flow in a radial direction through the blade passage, as you can see here, through the blade passage, and then it leaves through the casing or, uh, or the passage that is located here. So this assembly, the hub plate together with the blade is called the impeller, and the passage between the uh, casing and the impeller is actually a volute shape. Uh, it is volute shape because as more and more fluid uh, comes from the impeller onto the casing, the area of the casing increases to accommodate uh, the increasing amount of fluid uh, in order to maintain almost a constant velocity in the casing for the fluid to be sent out. 
You may also notice that you know, in this case that the uh, direction of rotation of the impeller is uh, clockwise, whereas the blades actually curve in this direction, which is uh, in the opposite direction to the direction of rotation. Such blades are usually called backward curved blades because the direction of curvature is in an opposite direction to the direction of rotation. The next example uh, or next application that we have is an automotive turbocharger. Uh, you are probably familiar with the turbochargers in the context of uh, diesel engines. These are used uh, in the intakes of diesel engines to compress the incoming air so that a higher mass of air may be admitted into the cylinder, uh, which increases the volumetric efficiency of the engine. So here we see a centrifugal compressor is located on the right. And just like the centrifugal pump, uh, its counterpart, the centrifugal pump, uh, air in this case enters uh, axially and then because of the supplied power it flows out radially and exits through the, uh, the volute casing. Uh, you may be recalled that the cross-sectional area of the volute casing increases in the direction of the uh, rotation for a, uh, for a pump or a compressor. So we can judge by the increasing cross-sectional area here that uh, the uh, the centrifugal pump spins in a clockwise direction when viewed from this end. Now here we have a centrifugal turbine which uh, does the exact opposite. So here uh, fluid enters uh, from the uh, casing radially inwards into the impeller and then leaves axially. Okay? So as the fluid goes through the impeller it expands and the expansion process causes an enthalpy drop, increases the uh, produces work, I'm sorry, produces work which is used to drive the uh, compressor. Now, since the flow is radially inward, we can imagine that the area of the scroll casing decreases in the direction of rotation. And judging by the cross section area here, it is easy to see that the direction of rotation of this impeller is in the anti clockwise direction when viewed from this side. Same direction. So, this is anti clockwise when viewed from here. Uh, clockwise will be viewed from here. So it is easy to see that the turbine drives the compressor. So the work that the turbine produces is used entirely to drive the compressor and compress the incoming air. So this machine would be classified as a thermal uh, turbo machine because it handles air <coughs> or the working substance is air. This would be classified as a hydro turbo machine because it handles water. And it's also a pump because it absorbs work. And here, because it absorbs work, we refer to this as a compressor. Now, some of the questions that we will try to answer uh, in this course are um, uh, questions uh, such as, uh, why does the fluid enter uh, a centrifugal compressor or a centrifugal pump axially and then move radially? Uh, why not the other way around? Is it possible for, it to, uh, for a compressor to have a flow going this way? Uh, so we will try to answer questions like this because we have taken it for granted now, but we will establish these things in a much more uh, precise manner uh, based on uh, the theory of turbo machines in the next module. So the next device that we look at is the so-called gas turbine. This particular uh, device is, to, is used for, is land-based and used for generation of uh, power. So here, as you can see, uh, the blades are visible clearly and they are mounted on a shaft. What is that? In contrast to this machine and this machine, where the flow through the uh, blades is actually in the radial direction. What is that? The flow may enter axially, but when it flows uh, in the passage between the blades, the flow is predominantly in the radial direction. There is no axial motion. Similarly, here also the flow is in the radial direction as it goes through the passage between the blades. Whereas in this case, when the fluid flows through the passage between the blades, the flow is in an axial direction or along the direction of the shaft. So you can see that you know, these blades are usually mounted on a disc, which in turn is mounted on the hub. And as the uh, air, which is the working substance here, flows through this blade, it is uh, progressively compressed. And you can also see that from the uh, height of the blades, you can see that the height of the blades uh, keeps decreasing in the direction of flow as the fluid is, uh, working substance or fluid is compressed. Then of course we have a combustor where uh, fuel is uh, burnt and heat is supplied to the working substance. 
and the working substance then undergoes expansion in a turbine here. So uh, we can uh, infer that the process in the turbine, uh, or this is the turbine, or the process in the turbine is expansion by looking at the size of the blade. So you can see that as the fluid expands, it uh, requires more and more uh, volume or cross-sectional area to go through. And consequently, the size of the blade also keeps increasing as the fluid keeps expanding. So this is the turbine section of the blade. This is the compressor section. Uh, contrary to the centrifugal compressor, here the turbine produces uh, power not only to run the compressor, it also produces, uh, produces power to run a generator, which in turn is used to generate electricity. This is also a uh, uh, gas turbine, but unlike the previous one, this one uh, is actually uh, used in aircraft engines for uh, propulsion purposes. So here, uh, we see similar uh, types of components. We see uh, a fan here and uh, compressor blades. Compressor blades can be identified here like this. So here is the combustor and here is the uh, turbine section. And we can infer that this is the turbine section based on the fact that the, uh, the diameter increases, the cross-sectional area increases. Uh, here, uh, in contrast to the previous one, we see uh, multiple uh, sets uh, uh, of compressors. So uh, we see a fan distinctly, and we see one set of blades here, which is uh, usually called the intermediate pressure compressor. We see another set of blades here, which is usually called the high pressure compressor. Now, as the uh, fluid uh, goes past the compressor, you can see uh, rings of turbine blades. So we see one uh, ring of turbine blades here, which is the high pressure turbine. Notice that the high pressure turbine is used to drive the high pressure compressor. They are connected on the same shaft. Unlike the previous device, which had one shaft, here we have multiple shafts. You know, the next set of uh, blades, which are these two, are actually called the intermediate uh, uh, turbine blades. And these all run on the same shaft. And this turbine is then used to drive the intermediate pressure compressor. So the intermediate turbine drives the intermediate pressure compressor. Then the last few stages are actually the uh, LP turbine stages. All of these are mounted on the same shaft and that shaft drives the fan. So you can see three uh, sets of uh, uh, blades or three sets of uh, compressor turbines. And each set is driven uh, on its own uh, shaft by uh, the corresponding turbine, which means that the shafts in this uh, uh, in this engine are actually hollow. So the outermost shaft is actually the uh, high pressure uh, turbine compressor set shaft. The inner next inner one is the, actually the shaft corresponding to the intermediate uh, pressure compressor and turbine, and the innermost shaft is the one which runs the fan in this case. Now, contrary uh, to the uh, previous example, here the turbine uh, uh, generates enough power to run the compressor and the remaining enthalpy of the fluid is actually taken to generate a thrust through a nozzle. Uh, this uh, video actually is uh, quite nice. It's available in YouTube. It's an overview on the GENX engine which is a turbofan engine similar to this one. I recommend this video very highly. It is um, uh, it's put together very nicely and uh, easily understandable. And it describes a lot of interesting details, uh, especially uh, relating to turbo missionary aspects of the aircraft engine. So I encourage you to watch this uh, video. So these uh, machines that we looked at so far, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, gas turbine, the aircraft engine, all these would be classified as axial machines and the two axial thermal turbo machines because air is the working substance in these, uh, in these turbo machines. Okay? The next one is also a thermal turbo machine and it is also an axial machine, uh, but it is an axial uh, steam turbine. So this is the GE uh, supercritical steam turbine, which is used for generating uh, power in, uh, in steam power plant. Okay. Once again, you see uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, sets of uh, blades here. Uh, this one is the high pressure uh, turbine. And we can infer that it is high pressure turbine, judging by the increase in size of the 
uh, blades from inlet to uh, outlet, you can see that the increase in size is not very much. So normally the first stage of the turbine uh, does not uh, uh, allow the fluid to expand a whole lot because we are operating at supercritical pressure. Doesn't expand a whole lot. So this is the initial expansion. Then we see uh, uh, double flow uh, turbine blades mounted on the same shaft here. So steam enters through the middle here then flows this way towards the right for this rotor and towards the left for this rotor. So this is steam which is uh, taken from a reheat boiler. So the steam after expansion from here is taken to a reheat boiler and the reheated steam is then brought back here for further expansion. So this would be the second stage expansion in, uh, in the supercritical uh, Rankine cycle. Now, we see here uh, another set of uh, uh, turbine rotors again mounted on the same shaft. So, uh, and it can be inferred from here that this is the third stage turbine because now you can really see that the steam is beginning to expand uh, considerably. In contrast to this, the expansion here is more, and in contrast to this, the expansion here is even more. So, it's quite possible that the turbine here is expanded almost up to the condenser pressure. And once again, you see entry uh, through the middle and then expansion to the right here and expansion to the right here. So the steam that enters here actually comes from this steam turbine, uh, which is then taken to a reheat boiler and then supplied to the third stage uh, turbine. So normally this would be the high pressure turbine. This would be like the intermediate pressure turbine. This would be the low pressure turbine. It is possible also to have additional uh, expansion stages if required. The last turbo machine that we look at is the so-called Pelton wheel or uh, the water wheel. The water wheel perhaps is the oldest known turbo machinery to mankind. This has been used for almost for centuries uh, by Chinese uh, for uh, not for generating power, but for uh, generating, um, uh, but for running other things, for example, for uh, drawing up water from a well and so on and so forth. So here we see uh, a runner, which is actually a, a drum on which these uh, cup shaped buckets are mounted. And the uh, runner itself is uh, key to the shaft, which, uh, which is rotated as the runner turns. Now water uh, is taken from a reservoir at a higher elevation and then it comes through this pipe, which is called the penstar, and this water impinges on the bucket turning the wheel in this way. And uh, again, if this uh, wheel were to be connected to a generator, there is sufficient head for the water here, then this could be connected to a generator to generate power, okay? And the flow through the, uh, uh, through the nozzle is regulated uh, by means of this sphere, which is uh, pushed in or pulled back. Uh, and uh, that allows uh, the flow rate to be controlled. If it is pushed in, then the flow rate obviously decreases. If it is pulled back, the flow rate increases. Now, one interesting aspect of this um, Pelton wheel is that it does not fit into the definition uh, of a turbo machine that we uh, gave uh, in the beginning. Uh, it was said that a uh, turbo machine is a rotary machine in which there is an enthalpy drop or enthalpy uh, rise. Now, this being a turbine, there should be an enthalpy drop, which should be converted into power. But in this case, there is no change in enthalpy of the fluid. The buckets are shaped in such a way that you know, the fluid impinges on the bucket and there is a change in the direction of the water flow. And the change in direction causes a change in momentum, which is then converted into a force on the rotor, which is then converted into power. So uh, this actually does not fit into the classification that we mentioned earlier because the enthalpy remains constant. But the Pelton wheel is a widely used turbine so we will have a detailed uh, look at the runner, how it generates power, and we will also uh, look at the design and working aspects of the Pelton wheel uh, later on when we talk about hydro turbo machines. Now this machine would be classified as a hydro turbo machine because the working fluid is water, and uh, the the flow in the rotor, strictly speaking, is uh, neither axial nor radial. So this is a very interesting uh, device in contrast to all the other devices that we looked at earlier. Now, this concludes our discussion on introduction and classification of turbo machines. And in the next lecture, we will take up the basic theory of turbo machines.